So, good morning, everybody. In the spirit of uh, being respectful for, uh, for those that uh, came here on time, I'm going to be starting the, uh, the tutorial sharply in uh, like 30 seconds or so. So, thank you for, for being here. The recording is, of course, be, going to be made available to, to those who might want to uh, access, access the tutorial later on. Uh, but starting on time will allow me to go through most of it. As is usual, I prepare an excessive amount of slides, but I'm going to be uh, selecting those based also on the, on the feeling of, of the moment and also from feedback from the audience. So, good morning. This is the uh, tutorial IJCNN uh, 2021 on deep learning for graphs. I'm well, the guy whose uh, contact uh, uh, references are provided there. So, David Baccio, I'm a professor at the Computer Science Department, University of Pisa in Italy. I'm as well a, uh, the chair and the founder of the IEEE Task Force on Learning for Structured Data, which is very much connected, as you might guess, to the topic of this, uh, of this tutorial. And there you find below the link to the uh, website of the task force. So I strongly uh, invite you to have a look at it. Contact me if you're interested uh, in joining the task force. Uh, what we do is basically uh, these kind of activities. We organize tutorials, special issues, special session, uh, on topics related with structured data and graphs are, of course, very much interesting into that word because are the one of the most expressive forms of structured data. So, um, uh, without further ado, let me start this uh, this tutorial. I'm not completely sure I always be uh, will be able to uh, see any messages posted on the chat, but uh, please feel free to to try and, and interact with me. I'm leaving the, so, some of the uh, windows from Zoom open so that you can try and interrupt me. I don't know whether you can speak. Uh, if you can, please feel free also to switch on the, the mics, okay? I'll do my best to try and answer on the fly if there are questions. So that's the idea of the tutorial today. And it's basically split in two, as you can clearly see from, from the picture. My idea is to start with a Mm, let's say general uh, introduction to the field. So something that uh, will be uh, working hopefully decently well for those that are entering the field of, uh, or willing to enter the field of deep learning for graphs. And after that, I'm gonna be uh, delving more into the detail of uh, something that I believe it's interesting, uh, which is uh, generative approaches towards deep learning for graphs which in a sense means that we're going to be picking up on something that is typically a bit less neural, a bit more probabilistic, but in the end, we're going to be seeing that actually everything boils down to using the neural-based approaches as well. And we're going to be seeing the concept of gen uh, generative learning from two, two perspectives, the meaning that, me, uh, that entails learning in an unsupervised way, and the meaning that entails learning to generate graphs. So that, that's the two perspectives we're going to be taking. And then, of course, uh, if, if time allows for, or as much as time allows, we're going to be going through research directions, okay, among the many that I have listed in my, in my slides, which, by the way, are going to be available on the website of the task force. So in full, okay, even those that I won't be able to cover, but you're going to be able to some references there if you're interested and so on. So uh, that's a typical uh, that's a typical slide. As I like to start with in my talks about learning for graphs because I believe it motivates strongly uh, why we want to, to work with graphs. And the question I typically ask the audience, I don't know how much you're allowed to answer to that, but if you are attempt to, is what do you see in this picture. And well, I know that's most likely I'm not going to be able to do that. 
Let me check. Uh, chats for something. Yeah, there is a chat. Good morning. Any, I'm looking at the chat. Any suggestion of what you see? A monkey. Thank you, Pedro. That's the question. That's the answer that I usually look for. A monkey, which is a pretty good guess, but actually, actually it's a flower. Okay. And the reason why we often mistake it for a monkey is that without proper context, we, are, we don't have all the uh, relevant information to determine the semantics of the piece of information, of, of the piece of data that we have. That's why we use graphs. Graphs are exactly what you want if you're seeking for information in context. Okay. So graphs allow you, are, let's say, a way of representing data that takes explicitly into consideration the fact that data is made of different pieces of information related by some form of relationship. So you can put really information into context, into proper context, and avoid possibly to, uh, to fall into these uh, tricks of uh, misunderstanding the semantics of a piece of information. Now, uh, very, very quickly on what's a graph, okay? I assume zero knowledge, so I, I mean, most likely everybody knows what's a graph here, but let me just assume uh, uh, zero knowledge, or at least provide you with my, uh, with what, is the interpretation of a graph that I'm going to be using throughout the, the, the tutorial, okay? A graph, it's what you see there, okay? It's a collection of uh, circles, which are the nodes or vertices of the graph. I call them U, V, that's, that's an index, okay? It's not an identity. And what we do have is, as, as anticipated, pieces of information attached to the graph, okay? So that basically means that for every node or vertex, or for some of them, we do have some information attached to it. We call it a node label. Don't consider this necessarily as a label in sense, in supervised sense, okay? This is possibly input information, not, uh, let's say, ground truth that you would like to predict. You can all have that as well, but that's an additional thing, okay? So in general, you can have uh, this node label there, I might laugh in the fact that it's vectorial. It doesn't have to be vectorial, okay? It can be as complex as you wish. There are uh, graphs in which that information is highly multimodal, okay? Take a social network. A social network is clearly a graph where you have nodes that represent individuals. And if you consider an individual, the information associated with an individual on a social network is of any kind, okay? It's images, it's text, it's videos, it's... Uh, structured information about the person, so age, uh, place of birth, uh, in which country is residing. Uh, exactly, yes, yes, that's not labels are basically features associated to the node. Is the information you wanna be processing in input, okay, to make your predictions basically, okay? But it can be uh, something like, if you consider for instance, of molecular graphs. Okay, molecules are graphs, and are graphs where you have atoms on the on the nodes and uh, atomic bonds between the nodes. Okay, uh, in that particular case, the feature information associated to to a node is, for instance, the type of the atom, or the atomic number, or other information that characterizes the atom. Okay, that you would like to use to make your prediction in the end. Now, the other important bit of structural information that you have on a graph is, of course, the edge, okay? The edge, let me take the pointer out so that I can, okay. So the edge is what you see here, uh, can be, uh, it's something that clearly links to, uh, to nodes and it can be oriented just like the one that we are seeing here because we have, a, have an arrow, but it can be also, uh, non-oriented, okay, undirected. Well, undirected is basically saying that this edge here, this undirected edge here that you're seeing is basically two edges. One directed edge is going from here to there and another edge that is going from there to here, okay? So uh, it allows to model, in a sense, bi-directional 
or symmetric associations, because that's what edge represent. They represent associations between uh, the information that is represented by the single nodes. Okay? And do we need to restrict to have a single edge between two nodes? No, of, of course not. Why? Because we can have, for instance, a label, so a feature associated also to edges. That means that I can have between V and U two different oriented arcs or edges, and those two oriented arcs represent different information, okay? And the different information maybe is characterized by the different labels that I have on the same, in the same, on the two different H. <clears throat> Sorry. So uh, just to make a practical example, let's go back to the social network case. An arc between two, two vertices might represent a friendship relationship, okay? Just classical friendship relationship. An arc between another arc between two, um, between the same two uh, edges might represent the fact that two people are co-workers, okay? That's a different kind of relationship, which I can model again with, the, with an arc between the very same, the very same uh, set of nodes same two nodes, okay? And I just need to use the label, for instance, of the arc to differentiate between arcs of type. Yes, edge labels are vectors, colors, weights, whatever, actually whatever, okay? You can even add flows on, 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 arc, on, on arcs, okay? Again, <clears throat> you can associate any source of information in a very general case to even to the to the edges. Okay, think about the richest information representation you can think of. Okay, in principle you can have that. Then, of course, in practice, with the task that we are addressing now, where you typically have its vec, its label uh, or features only on the nodes. Sometimes you do have some features also on the arcs, but these are often most likely discrete rather than. Uh, and continuous because they, they, they denote the type of the relationship. But in general, nothing prevents to have a very general uh, uh, information on the nodes and on the arcs, okay? Sequences uh, as, a, as a feature in nodes and so on, like in flow graphs. And that's where the thing gets messy, thanks to this guy here, which is a cycle. And cycle are a, what makes graph pretty much ex as expressive as they are, but at the same time is the source of all the complications. Okay, we know that from graph theory that cycles are what make a graph powerful, but as well make every action, well, many, let's say, operation of, on a graph computationally, let's say, important, if not NP complete. So that's it. that is what we need to care about also in neural networks, machine learning for graphs, because that's where uh, things get tricky. Okay, so all in all, we're going to be seeing that uh, doing deep learning with graphs basically means to uh, basically means finding nice ways to be dealing with these cycles. Okay, but this is all in all what I've. Uh, the message that I've tried to convey. Okay, they are useful because they allow to represent relationship in the data. Okay, structures and most like uh, in particular graphs are interesting for that. This is just a preliminary uh, attempt of providing an intuition of why learning with graphs is important because graphs are the result of very many, uh, let's say, um, natural and artificial processes. What you see there is here a result of a natural process. It's a chemical compound. What you see here is the result, for instance, of a, an artificial process is a social network. Don't know whether it's artificial or natural. I mean, it's a mix of the two. This is certainly artificial because it's a, it's a graph describing some, some sort of a relationship between some systems. What you see here is a, is a point cloud. The point cloud by, per se is not, is not a graph but it's neither Euclidean data. And actually, uh, you know very well that um, most likely if you have ever approached it, that you can trans easily transform point, point cloud data into a graph just by taking a point 
and connecting it to the nearest neighbors in, uh, in Euclidean space and then create a graph that describes the manifold that this, uh, this point cloud data uh, represents. Okay, so even point cloud data can be tackled with the learning for graphs methods. I'm gonna be uh, giving more examples and more practical examples of the applications afterwards, but this is just uh, preliminary intuitions, okay? Now, uh, the additional bit that we're missing, so we have introduced uh, graphs, we have introduced why graphs are interesting. We haven't said why deep learning with graphs is interesting. And the stress is on the word steep because I, I would like to stress out the fact that the deep aspect is important and is particularly relevant for graphs. And it's what makes it particularly well suited as an approach to be dealing with this kind of, of structures. Okay, so in order to do that, let's focus on the, on the yellow dot there. That's our target node. Okay, we would like to do something with that node. Doing something with that node in neural terms means that in order to make any prediction, just like with any other piece of information we are dealing with in this deep learning world, we would like to find a neural representation of that thing there, okay? That thing there is a node and the node is a pretty discrete object within a discrete object, okay? Because it's a discrete element of a discrete structure, which is the graph. So I need to take this discreteness and transform it into a neural representation, which typically entails finding a mapping into this metric space, into this RD space, which is the space of the neural activations, okay? And these neural activations need to be as much as possible uh, informative, informative of the structure, informative for the task in order to solve the task. So how does deepness interact with this need of finding a good representation for that node. Well, think about what would happen if we go uh, deeper and deeper into a network, okay? Let's pick up a network and study how a hierarchical representation operates or a hierarchical network operates on that particular graph. So if that, what you have up here is your, let's say, abstraction of a deep neural network. And this is the input layer. So it's the layer that is going to be receiving the features of the node, okay? What is happening at this first layer of the node, of the, of the neural network? What is happening at this first layer of the neural network is that basically you are changing the representation of the node that you add from the input layer, yellow node, by including information from the direct neighborhood of the node, okay? What you can expect to happen then if you, when you transit to the next layer is that you're enlarging the scope of your view over the graph with respect to, the, to this node here. So basically at layer, let's say, let's call it layer uh, zero, one, two, layer two, you're gonna be having a representation of your yellow node, which takes into consideration information about the second hope neighborhood of your node, okay? And then guess what happens if you enlarge, if you go, as you go deeper, you enlarge your view over the graph. So the representation of your yellow node becomes informed of the information on a larger context, okay? So that in uh, deep neural networks for graphs is what allows you to, rep to represent a node in the context of what's surrounding it. And the deeper you go, the larger the context you can take into consideration is, okay? Uh, also, I just saw this question from uh, Kifu. So any data can be represented as a graph in some way. Much data can be represent naturally be represented as a graph. You can cast probably every data into a graph-based representation. The question is whether it's meaningful or whether that graph structured representation add something, okay? Because if it doesn't add something, you're just making things a lot more complicated from a computational point of view and many other perspectives, okay? So yes, in principle, you can, but you need to be careful. Okay, so in the end, what we are seeking to do 
is basically by deep learning finding a representation, okay? A representation of nodes. And thanks to that, I'm allowed to incrementally enlarge my representation. And then of course, as soon as I have a representation for all the nodes in my graph, I can find the representation for the whole graph, for instance. I just need an aggregation function, okay? So we're gonna be seeing that this is basically how it works. Right now, it's everything on an abstract level, then we're gonna be seeing how this is casted to specific volumes, okay? So, uh, what are the challenges when you're learning with graphs? Well, you need, first of all, to think that when you're learning from a population of samples, that's what is expressed here, when those samples are vectors, everything is fine, come on vectors, uh, you assume that they are fixed dimensionality, that you have all the feature more or less available, or you impute them a little bit, but anyway, when you feed them to a neural network, that's the assumption you're, you're taking. With already when you move from vectors to sequences, things start changing slightly. Why? Because sequences, when you feed sequences to neural networks, sequences can change in length. So this guy here, which is sequence number one, might have length 10. This guy here, which is uh, the second sample, might have length 15. So already with sequences, you, you understand that you need to be able to cater for data that can have different length. And that's why, for instance, we do have recurrent neural networks because recurrent neural networks, thanks to weight sharing in time, allow to cater for the fact that we can deal with the length varying sequences, okay? Now think about the equivalent for graphs. A graph, a data set of graphs, is a data set of guys here, okay, where each a uh, figure here is actually a graph and different figures, so different samples will have a, possibly a completely different topology, okay? So different number of nodes, different connectivity, and no, in general, no mapping whatsoever of the identity in, of node one in graph one and node one in graph two. That is something you, typically cannot leverage, okay? Node identity is not something that is available. Node identity might be available in a specific, uh, let's say, type of deep learning for graphs. That is when you don't have a population of graphs, but rather you have a population of nodes bound into a unique network, okay? That's learning with network data. And there, different uh, nodes have a different, uh, identity, you can possibly leverage that identity, but the fact is that you have a single graph in that particular case, okay? But anyway, you are going to be facing anyway a cycle, uh, a, a challenge, which is the presence of cycle. Even with, um, with the network data, you cannot be sure or strict about the topology. Why? Because even with network data, what, ha what can happen is node and edge in action. What does that mean? It means that at some point, if you're trained on a graph with a certain connectivity, on a network with a certain connectivity and a certain number of nodes, what can happen is that a new node comes up. You need to do, or the graph is enlarged. Think about the social network, okay? You train on a social network, which is a big connected network, but you train on a social network uh, image taken today. Tomorrow, somebody new subscribe to the new, to the social network. You don't want to retrain. You want to be able to leverage a model trained on a social network picture until uh, taken until today, and to make prediction tomorrow. Okay, and tomorrow you're going to be having more nodes anyway. Okay, so you need to be flexible about the fact that topology changes anyway. What kind of task can you mount on the top of uh, of this? Uh, let's say, uh, structures. Well, the classical one, actually, okay? So first of all, we differentiate, as I already said, between two type of task, network data versus structure classification of regression. Network data basically means the social network example. I have a single network, single graph, okay? What I do have then is a set of nodes which have labels like targets, for instance, and you can, uh, uh, these are depicted with colors, colored nodes, okay? 
So these two, these two nodes have class red, these two nodes have class yellow, for instance. So the task here is to find a metric representation of the nodes, thanks to the deep learning approach, in order to be able to do what? To fit a predictor, train it on this neural representation, train it on the nodes that have a color, so that then I can use the predictor on the nodes that don't have a color and I want to infer the color. Okay, so in other words, I know that these two guys like chocolate ice cream. Okay, I know that these two items here, the blue uh, three items here, like, I don't know, um, hazelnut ice cream. What's the ice cream that this node here likes? Okay, I can fit a predictor and I can use it to predict for it. Okay, under the assumption that the kind of chocolate. Uh, scope you like, it's somehow something that is dependent on your friendship relationship. That's, of course, possibly a very poor assumption, but that's the intuition, okay? And instead, on the structure classification or regression task, what you have is a data set of graphs, okay? So each sample is a different graph, so you don't have a single graph. What you would like to do is to find Again, a metric representation, but for the old structure, okay? Why? Because then you're gonna be fitting to this metric representation, to this particular vector that represented ideally all the information available in the full graph and fit it to a predictor again to solve a classification or regression task on the full graph, okay? Uh, that's a classical example of what you would like to do with chemical compounds. With chemical compounds, you ideally would like to be able to fit a predictor that tells you if a chemical compound is toxic versus non-toxic by uh, taking a data set of known molecules to be toxic and non-toxic. You find a way to encode them into vectorial embedding thanks to the neural network for graph, then put a predictor in the end, train it to recognize toxic versus non-toxic, and then when somebody comes out with a new molecule, then you take the new molecule and you automatically get an answer on whether it's toxic or not. Okay, and that's a classical application because uh, it speed up uh, proper, uh, property prediction for molecules. Okay, property prediction for molecules in many cases is something you can obtain by chemical physical simulation. Only issue is that chemical physical simulation take like Power stays okay. You can get a prediction for the same from the same properties in milliseconds. That's way better, okay. Way cheaper at least, especially if you are uh, accurate in your predictions. There is actually a wider class of learning problems that you would like to tackle, and that at some point I'm going to be showing you uh, why they're interesting, which is structured transaction. What transaction means that you would like to learn to generate a graph in output. Okay, so the graph is no longer the thing that you have an in input, it's your prediction. The prediction of your network is a graph Y, okay? And this graph Y is maybe produced in response to an input which is vectorial, okay? So for instance, coming back to our molecule example, uh, I feed my neural network in input with a vector X that describes the chemical or physical properties I want, and in output, I get the molecule that is fitting those chemical uh, properties, okay? Not saying that this can be done easily. This is the holy grail of chemistry. So I give you what I want. I get a, in milliseconds an answer of the molecule that I like, that, I, that, that fits those properties. This is not done yet. If you manage to do that, you're going to be very rich, most likely, and probably not Nobel Prize. Uh, another task that you can have, even a more general one, is is a task in which you have an input, a specific graph. So again, the input now is again a graph, X. And what you want in output is another graph, Y, possibly different in topology than, than the original graph, X. So again, chemical compounds in input, a chemical compound which works up to a certain extent, which has some properties. In output, a chemical compound which has the, origin, the properties of the original compound plus an additional one. Okay, the ability to be soluble in water, which the original one doesn't have. Okay, so you want to change the original structure with some new property, additional property. Okay? Or the evolution in time of some neural net or some 
social network. Okay? This is a very challenging uh, and general task, clearly, and very much open to research. Now, by this time, I've hopefully convinced you that learning with graphs is basically about learning how to deal with cycles, which is the nasty bit. Okay, what really differentiates the general uh, classes of graph from the rest of structural data, from trees, from sequences, from dugs. Okay. And that's where the smartness came into play. How do I do that? And well, actually, uh, Deep learning for graphs has been an exploding field over, over the last years. And you have, if you have attempted at having a look at it, you might have witnessed a huge number of works and models being proposed. But try and believe me, in the end, it all boils down to basically two main approaches. And interestingly enough, those two main approaches are not from the 20, uh, from the 2000s. Those two approaches are actually, well, from the, from the 2015 or 2020, okay? Those two, those two approaches are from the early 2000s, okay? Uh, so the early neural network approaches to, to deal with psychic graphs with variant topology date back to, to, to basically 2015, 2019, Meaning that 2015 was the time in which they were uh, the models were proposed in a conference. 2019 is the time in which those those two very same approaches appeared in the transaction on neural networks. So actually, there is a very nice perspective also of the uh, IEEE Comput uh, Computational Intelligence Society in this, because really the transactions on neural networks, which are the journal from the IEEE CIS played a, a huge role in this. And also IJ, IJCNN played a role because one of the, of the, um, of the models were originally uh, published in IJCNN 2005, which, uh, which I'm gonna be getting there, okay? And there is even an, uh, a nicer perspective, at least for me in this historical view over the approaches, which is a geographical one, and it's nice for me because I'm exactly sitting on that geographical perspective because the two models, for some reason, were proposed into this green land here. This green land here is the Tuscany region of this boot here, which is Italy, okay? And funnily enough, they were produced by two uh, different universities in, uh, in that green region, which are the University of Pisa, my alma mater, and, uh, and the place where I now teach and by University of Siena, okay, which is some 150 kilometers from here, not far. And let me now go through the two different approaches and then we're gonna be seeing how in the modern uh, deep learning for graphs, those two approaches really pop out again, okay? So the first approach, the one that actually comes from Siena and that was published in, uh, let's say in, in its journal form in 2009 in transaction by uh, Scarcelli, Gori, and colleagues, and that you find the references, it's called the graph neural network, and that's very famous, okay? It's one of the, of the uh, names that you find for deep learning for graphs. So the idea of this model is very smart because it's basically building on recurrent neural networks, okay? So it's saying, you know what? In order to represent this node here, Okay, this node here is, is a vertex of your graph, is x1. And you know, when you read L1, L3, L4, those are the node features. Okay, so the labels attached to, to the nodes. In order to find a vectorial encoding for L1, what I can do is start visiting the graph. Okay, so start taking paths within the graph and using the information uh, and, and a path in the graph is a sequence. Okay, so I can actually use a recurrent neural network then to find, for instance, an encoding for L1 by taking paths into the graph. What's the problem there is that, take this undirected graph, is that L1, in order to find the encoding for X1, 
I might find the encoding of X1 by using the encoding from the recurrent neural network from node X3, X4, X6, X2, X9, if it's in the path towards X1. So I can use that encoding, okay? Now, let's have a look at how I find the encoding of X4, where in order to find the encoding of X4, I need the encoding of X1. Oh, hmm, that's an issue because I just said that in order to find the encoding of of node one, I needed the encoding X4. So now I just realized that in order to find the encoding X4, I need the encoding of X1. That's a causal dependency. Yeah, that's what cycles are. A mess because they introduce mutual dependency that don't allow to make assumption and an ordering. Huh, so how do I solve that? Well, that's where the smartness comes in. The smartness comes in on the fact that you can actually have mutual dependencies between X1 needing X4 in order to be computed and X4 needing X1 to be computed. If you assume that the function that you're using to find, in, to find X1 or X4 or X10 for what matters is a contractive one. Contractive means that it has a, um, an accumulator point, Let's, um, a fixed point, sorry. Okay, a fixed point. So if you iterate this dynamical system, because it's a recurrent neural network, it's a dynamical system. If you iterate it through infinity, let's say infinite time, at some point, X, uh, the encoding of X1 will stop, the encoding of, uh, of node one, so X1 will stop changing because that will have reached a fixed point, okay? So when you get the encoding of all the, net, of all the nodes to fixed point, you know that they will never change. Even if the sum of the neighbors will change their encoding, those, those ones will stop changing. And that, will, that stop of change uh, between uh, encodings will propagate. And at some point, all the network will come down, all the nodes will get to their fixed points. You will have a fixed point encoding to all the nodes. Okay, you just need to impose contractivity to what? To this function here, which is the function that is returning to you the encoding of the nodes. That function there is a neural network. So you just need to impose your, 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 your let's say, neural layer to be contracted. Fair enough, imposing contractivity on, uh, on, on something that changes con constantly due to learning, it's not nice. Okay, not computationally nice. So the solution that Scarcelli and Gori found is not imposing the strict constraint of contractivity on all the time instance. So every time you change your weight, you make your weight matrix contractive, you can't do that, okay? Because otherwise it takes forever. What you do, you impose asymptotic constraints. So you ensure that your mapping is contractive asymptotically at some point at the end of the learning. Okay, and that makes it feasible. The thing that is still tricky is that every time you want an embedding for a node, an encoding for a node, you need to reach fixed point. So even at inference time, if you want to find your neural embedding for a node, you really need to bring this dynamical system to stability. Okay, so wait possibly infinite time. Actually, you don't wait infinite time. Okay, you wait a fixed amount of time until things start stabilizing. But still, even at inference time, you need to iterate through the graph much time. And if the graph is big, this has some cost, okay? That's where the second um, approach comes into play, which is an approach by Alessio Micheli, which is a colleague, who is a colleague here at the University of Pisa. Again, Transaction Neural Network 2005. It's called the contextual approach or the neural network for graphs. The neural network for graphs says, you know what, the issue with the uh, with the approach that we've seen before is the fact that we have a recurrent neural network and the recurrent neural network needs to have some sort of ordering in order to compute things. And when you do have loops, you have mutual dependency, you don't have such a, uh, a total ordering between nodes. So what if we don't use recurrence? We use feedforward stuff. How can we use feedforward stuff in, uh, in a graph? Well, we use layering. So what the uh, neural network for graph proposes is, you know what, let's start with a single layer, okay? What you see here is a very simple graph, which has, a, has already a cycle. A layer one 
my neural network will learn to encode blue node, let's focus on blue node, based only on the information about the label that this blue node has. Okay, so the actual input label. Then what happens? Uh, then what happens is that I train this first one layer neural network to predict something in output, okay? And that something is your supervised task, like molecule classification. This would be a very dumb one layer network, but I train it, okay? Once I train it, I froze the uh, weights of this feed forward neural network. This is a perceptron, it only receives an input, input from, uh, from the node itself, okay? It's a feed forward network. Then, as soon as I completed training it, I get an error. This error is not satisfactory. So what I do is I add the second layer, okay? I connect the second layer to the output of the first layer. And then what I do is, again, I focus on node blue. And in order to find the encoding of node blue in the second layer, what I do is I look at this neighbor. And its neighbor, I don't look at the encoding of the neighbor at layer two, no because that would create mutual dependencies. I look at the encoding of blue at layer L1. Why? Because at layer L1, the encodings are already computed. There is no mutual dependency. So I can use them to, en to encode blue at this layer, okay? And again, I can do the same for all the other nodes and attach this layer to the output layer that is performing the outputs and see how now the let's say the accuracy goes. Still unsatisfactory, I add a new layer. And again, in this layer, I'm gonna be using the information from layer two, which is trained and frozen to find a new representation of nodes and so on. And I will keep adding layers by layers until I get stability. So my error doesn't not reduce, okay? And this model is actually trained layer wise, it's trained by using uh, an error which is uh, an algorithm that is cascade correlation. Okay, it's, a, it's an algorithm from the 90s, Falman and Lavier, I think. And uh, well, it works. It's local, it's layer wise. The nice thing that you are going to be finding in modern approaches from this neural network graph is this contextual approach, the layering approach. The fact that I'm using layer L1, L1 graph, L2, L3 are connected. That's okay. The, the way the thing worked is that the input to the neural network at layer two are the output of the neural network at layer one. Okay. Uh, the input to layer uh, to the neural network at layer three is received from the output of layer two for sure. If you'd like, you can even have inputs from layer one. So. In principle, you can get input from all the layer below you, okay? That does not create issues. Those are just jump connection. Why? Because these are already trained and the embeddings have already been obtained when you, when you look at L2 in order to compute L3. Uh, so is, uh, 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 the question is, is the whole process obtaining an embedding for only the node marked in blue. No, it's only the node marked in blue just for not messing up. It's, it's only an highlight uh, for that specific node. You repeat it exactly in a similar way only for, uh, for the all other nodes. Layer-wise, exactly. What's the input well one? Uh, Kifu, the input well one is the original graph, okay? So the original graph has some information on the nodes, okay? And that information is the feature of the node. So for instance, look at this blue node, for example. This blue node, if it's, a, if it's a, um, an atom from a molecule, will be the identity of that atom, okay? For, for, so for instance, the fact that the atom is, uh, is carbonium, okay? Uh, the input for this thing, hydrogen, whatever, okay? So at the beginning, you only have information on layer one, only on that specific node. And layer two, you have information on that specific node plus its neighbors, but the neighbors from the layer below. In L1, all nodes are initialized random. Uh, in L1, L1 is basically a multi-layer perceptron. Okay, so initialize it at random and then you train it 
by back by error okay by error correction let's say error correction because it's cascade correlation not back propagation but error correction okay so you fit a single graph you perform a prediction for the graph you check what's your prediction error and you update the the, um, the weights of your multilayer percent okay so you do that for all the samples and you iterate okay until convergence for this layer then when lay when uh, when the error for layer one is at convergence if you're not satisfied with the error that you have achieved you add another one another layer where is the MLP in the architecture? Every layer, when you read L1, is an MLP. So this works in no different way than with the neural networks for sequences. When you have a recurrent neural network, you unfold a neural layer on the length of the sequence, okay? So you recopy the same neural layer for all the elements in the sequence, okay? When you have a graph, and you have a multilayer perceptron, you basically recopy the multilayer perceptron for each node in your graph, exactly in the same way. So when you read L1, that's a multilayer perceptron just recopied for each of the nodes in the graph. When you read L2, it's a different multilayer perceptron recopied for all the nodes in the graph, different from the, no the, the multilayer perceptron you had L1, okay? Now the edges serve to, uh, for you to understand how you propagate information, okay? So the fact that there is an edge between, uh, from the white nodes to the blue node means that a layer L2, you're gonna be taking you know, as input to the copy of the multilayer perceptron for blue node and layer two will take an input, the uh, output of the multilayer perceptron on a layer one for this node here, for this node here, and this node here. Okay. Clearly, it requires that this multilayer perceptron here can somehow cater for inputs of varying dimensionality, but we're going to be getting there. I know that the first time one sees this, it's not completely intuitive to understand how a multilayer perceptron unfolds on the structure of a graph, but it's really not much different than unfolding on a neural, on a, uh, on a sequence. Now, these were, let's say, the two original approaches from the early 2000s. Then we had the deep graph networks, which is basically the modern way of looking into that. And it's a, uh, what I call the nomenclature nightmare, because you're going to be finding it exactly the same model under different names. Okay, you find the, the, the same research area defined as deep learning for graphs, graph neural network, neural network for graphs, convolutional neural network for or on graphs, graph convolutional neural networks, learning graph embedding, learning other embeddings, graph convolutional networks, geometric deep learning. They all mean the same, really, more or less. Okay, Sh shades of the same thing. So that's just some context so that when you Google thing on Google's, uh, Google Scholar, you know that if you change slightly the keywords, you get different, different responses. But they are for the same models. Now, let me now go very uh, as, as quickly as I can through a survey of some recent approaches. I would like to leave space for, for questions at the end. So I'll try to keep a good pace, but again, keep flowing with the questions. It's, it's no problem. So what I'm gonna be uh, doing is first drink a little bit of water because I'm <laughs> getting a sore throat. Then go through at least three family of approaches, okay? Convolutional neural networks for graphs. So those approaches that attempt at solving the problem of learning with graphs by generalization from uh, convolutional neural networks on images. Why? Because images are grids of pixels. They, off, they uh, look an awful lot like a graph because a, gra a grid is a graph, okay? But the grid is a regular graph, so not what we need. Spoiler, spoiler. 
but we're going to be going through those approaches. Then we go through the recurrent graph processing, or in other way, the contractive approach, the Scarcelli and Gori approach in a modern way, and then the contextual graph processing, the Michele approach in a modern, in a modern way. Okay, and those are the names of some of the main approaches for the three families of models. So let's start with the convolution and neural network for graphs. Okay, here the idea is say, how can we perform convolution on graphs? Okay. In images, I can perform convolution in the spatial domain by placing a, a kernel, which is basically a tiny matrix of, of parameters on a matrix, on, on, a, on my image, centering on a pixel and performing element-wise multiplication followed by summation that's, uh, that's convolution basically. And this looks like a node surrounded by other nodes, okay? What is the equivalent? And, and then sliding this thing, the same, the very same window to all, applying it to all the pixels. So the question is, what would be the equivalent on a graph? I can center on a node and then have my window of parameters multiplied by the neighbors of a node and then slide this window on the other nodes of the graph. Yeah, in principle, yes, but we're going to be seeing that this is not easy. Why? Because in a pixel, sorry, in, a, in, a, in an image, I have a regular grid. A regular grid allows you to have a regular neighborhood around the node, whereas a general graph doesn't have a regular neighborhood around the node. And it, it provides you with a, an ordering, okay? Left to right, top to bottom, which you don't have in a graph, in a general graph, okay? So that's why people started reasoning on graphs on the spectral domain. And you know that there is one thing called the convolutional theorem that tells you that if you're interested in convolution, you can leverage Fourier analysis to uh, trade convolution with, uh, with multiplications. How? Well, basically, if this is your image F, this is your, uh, let's say, uh, convolutional filter G, you can take the convolution of a filter to an image, uh, send it out on the Fourier domain, okay, on the spectral domain by Fourier transform F, that will be equivalent to Fourier transforming the image and Fourier transforming the graph and then perform multiplication in the spectral domain. And then with the inverse transform, you can go back in the, spec in the spatial domain, okay? So that might be helpful because instead of performing convolution on a spatial domain, if I manage to find a way to perform a Fourier transform on the, on the graph, then I can operate on the, on the spectral domain, okay? And well, that's actually not difficult because what I just need to do is to think at the graph in terms of, of a signal and then find a uh, orthonormal basis which is what you need to perform your Fourier analysis, okay? your Fourier transform. Now, let me get into this first, the spectral convolutions, and then uh, we, we try to recover the spatial ones, okay? Very quickly, in the spectral scenario, what I assume is that I have a single graph, okay? So in order to operate with the spectral uh, neural network for graphs, we need basically to assume that we have a single, uh, single network, okay? Now, this graph is allowed to have weights, okay, labeling edges. It's not needed. It's not present to weight is one, okay, so dumbly for all. But if you have weights, you're allowed to have weights. What's important is that you have a signal on a node. What's a signal on a node? It's the label of the node. It's the feature vector of the node, okay? So in let's say in another term, we say that we have functions attaching values to nodes, okay? And that's the signal we would like to Fourier, to, uh, to Fourier decompose. So my task is to process the signal defined on a graph structure, these functions fi, the labels, okay? So in other words, what I'm gonna be doing is pack the labels of the nodes into a matrix, okay? Uh, this matrix will have a certain number of rows, one row for each of the nodes in the graph, okay? And we'll have a certain number of columns depending on the number of features that I'm attaching to each node. Uh, and not, not really in this, in, well, you can work on that. 
but originally no. Uh, now, how do I do that? I need an orthonormal basis, okay? But an orthonormal basis can be nicely found for a graph because you just need to eigenden and compose its Laplacian. The Laplacian of a graph is basically a manipulation of the adiacency symmetries, okay? With the addition of the degree of the node, but it's, think about it as, a, as the adiacency matrix of a graph, more or less, okay? What you can do, you take your Laplacian and you find the eigenvector decomposition of that Laplacian. That's an orthonormal basis. That's the orthonormal basis that you need in order to perform the Fourier decomposition, okay? The Fourier transform. So we're gonna be projecting the node signals, which is basically a matrix of, uh, of vectors work for each node, onto the eigenvectors of the Laplacian, okay? This is U. You have packed your, your eigenvector into this matrix U. So what we're gonna be doing is, this is the original graph, okay? This is the convolution that I want to operate on graph. This is the, let's say, matrix of parameters in a spatial domain, okay? This is the convolution on the graph on the spatial domain, which I don't know how to solve, okay? So what I use is a trick. I transform this into the Fourier transform of the signal defined on the graph, the Fourier transform of, this, of the, let's say, parameter matrix, the inverse Fourier transform of the result of the multiplication of the two. This is given by the convolutional theorem. This is the way to come back from the spectral domain through the inverse Fourier transform back into the spatial domain, okay? Now, the Fourier, the forward Fourier transform is obtained by the orth orthonormal basis of the Laplacian. The inverse Fourier transform is as well obtained by the orthonormal basis, it's just the, the uh, transposed version, okay? So you perform the forward Fourier transform by multiplying your the, the signals defined on your nodes for the transposed of the orthonormal basis, you do the same for the, for the graph. So when you see this W lambda, what this W lambda is, is actually the convolutional filter G from the spatial domain projected into the spectral domain thanks to the, to the orthonormal basis U, okay? The fact that we have lambda, W lambda means that this thing here is a set of parameters W which somehow contain information on the lambdas and the lambdas what are, since you are the orthonormal basis are the eigenvalues of the Laplacian, okay? So this is basically a set of field. This is a filter in spectral domain, okay? This is a field, a convolutional filter in a spectral domain. It's a parameterized filter. So it will have a set of parameters and by backpropagation, I can learn those parameters, basically, okay? And the, the fact that this thing will basically look like something that is a function, is a combina linear combination of the eigenvalues, okay? Where the parameters of the uh, linear combination are the parameters of my uh, convolution, okay? And this is just a way to bring everything back, F minus one, into the spatial domain. Now, the key thing about this model is that that W contains the, the lambda. It means that the parameters you're going to be finding, if you use this as a convolutional operation in a convolutional layer, okay, this you can put it into a neural network layer. It's just a neural network layer. You can fit it in place of a convolutional layer in a convolutional neural network. The problem that you obtain is that the parameters that you find contain information on the specific graph Laplacian. This means that if you train these parameters W on a specific graph, you cannot apply it to a different graph. That's why spectral graph convolution works only in network-like data, okay? When you have a single network, single graph. And a few considerations, so, about this approach before we move forward. So based on that dependency on a graph Laplacian, we cannot easily handle multiple graphs, okay? You might work around that, as you might work around the fact that you can have negative weights, as you might work around the fact that uh, you don't, you cannot in principle work on, uh, 
on directed graph, but you actually can work on directed graph. You can multiply them. This is a consequence of the fact that you require weights to be uh, all positive. Uh, but there are extensions, okay? There are approximations and extensions that allow you somehow to cram things and to make it work also for other non-ideal, uh, let's say, uh, non-ideal settings, but still it's a, it's a very strong approximation. Usually, okay? Another thing that is an issue with this um, vector approach is that you don't really have control of what's happening on a spatial domain. Okay? You don't really know what this filter that you're learning on the spectral domain is actually doing on the spatial domain. Okay, whether there is any correspondence between what you learn, what uh, between the node you are representing and the neighbors of the node, because everything is not done in the spatial domain where you know that there exists a node and its neighbors is doing on the spectral domain where you only know about spectral frequencies. Okay, and all in all, there is the last issue is that you need to eigen decompose a Laplace which is sides of the uh, adjacency matrix. And if you're dealing with a social graph, it's billion of nodes, you might not want to start doing an eigen decomposition of a, of a Laplace. Uh, okay. Of a simple graph in it, eigen, uh, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, it's basically taking, let me, uh, find a way to write it down, okay? Uh, let me find. Uh, okay, enough to write uh, on this. So, how uh, can possibly, how oh, I can possibly do this? That why it's not working. Okay. That should be able. Okay, so there are different types of Laplacians. Okay, it, it really depends on uh, yeah, yeah. I've, I found a I found a way to write on uh, on PowerPoint should be working. I try to write it here. Thanks, Pedro. Um so there really exist multiple types of Laplacian. It really depends on what you would like to obtain and and the kind of properties you want on your on your matrix, but uh, one of the most widely used is the normalized Laplacian, which basically starts from the adjacency matrix of the vector. Hopefully, you're reading this. This is the adjacency matrix of a of a graph, meaning that there you go. This is a matrix in which you have a, a number of rows, which is the number of nodes, a number of columns, which is the number of of columns, and you have a one if there is an edge or the weight, okay, here. A one if there is an edge between a specific node and another node, or a zero if there is no edge. Or if you have a weighted graph, you have the weight associated with that edge here, okay? That would be the adjacency matrix. With the normalized Laplacian, what you do is you basically consider the, um, the degree matrix, okay? And the degree matrix is basically telling you uh, the degree of a node, okay? It's something that is a cement, is a, uh, my drawing skills with this thing are bad, but yeah, that's what you get. It's again a matrix which is now diagonal and you get the degree of a node on the, on the, um, on the single element of the diagonal. So you get a degree of node one in position one, one, two in position two, two, and so on. And then once you have that, basically you can build your Laplacian, for instance, in the, well, one way of building it, the simple graph Laplacian would be basically to have uh, the degree matrix subtracted, well, the adjacency matrix subtracted from the, from the, uh, from the degree, okay. The type of uh, Laplacian that we typically use because it's uh, uh, of its uh, properties, uh, um, spectral properties, the Laplacian that we use 
usually in graph convolutions is the normalized one because basically it allows you to bound the eigenvalues okay uh, of your of your laplacian and if you have bound on the eigenvalues you can uh, sort of approximate uh, things using uh, using Chebyshev polynomial in a nice way you have some nice bounds on the approximation that you have okay and that is a slightly different formulation because it's basically the degree matrix to the power of uh, one up. Sorry for the very <laughs> bad drawing skills, but that's okay. And uh, well, of the Laplacian that you have there. So let, let me write it down in another way. Let's forget about it. I, I write it in the extended version. So it's equal to. Uh, I, the identity matrix of the correct size minus the degree matrix, okay? One half minus one half, okay? Uh, the agency matrix here, uh, degree matrix again, minus one half, okay? Okay, so that's basically how you write your Laplacian. And that has the property of, I think, bounding the largest eigenvalue to two, okay? And that is what is used, uh, for instance, to uh, state that, that uh, W lambda thing that we have at some point, uh, when we multiply it with the, when we, when we have that, we can approximate this thing with some Chebyshev polynomial and that if you do, take this Chebyshev polynomial, which is a sum of uh, over the powers of, uh, of, uh, of uh, eigenvalues, can be bound to a finite sum up to a certain point and you make an error in doing that that is contained, okay? So that's basically the, the idea. And what are the, there are interpretations of the eigenvectors associated with the eigenvalues um, that uh, connect the spectral domain with the spatial domain, okay? For instance, uh, the first eigenvector, so the, the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue, I think it cuts the, it's corresponding to cutting the largest connected component. I um, might be messing up, but I think that's, that's kind of, uh, of relationship you, you do have and uh, the successive eigenvectors are somehow, so if you order them in order of eigenvalue, they are, uh, they are connected with, uh, with communities in the graph. And that's what spectral clustering, for instance, leverages. The fact that if you uh, decompose uh, a graph that represents uh, a data set of the relationship between items in a data set, you are basically clustering because you're extracting connected components from, uh, from the graph by the eigenvalue, eigenvectors of the, of the Laplacian. I don't know whether this is providing a sufficiently, um, let's say, uh, concrete picture of what's a Laplacian and, it, and its properties. Now, uh, let me go back to, uh, laser pointer, okay? So that I, I, I try to go back now to the spectral domain, but if there is anything additional on this, we can take it uh, afterwards. Now, uh, this was in the spectral domain. And the thing is that, yes, there are connection between the spectral domain and the spatial domain as I anticipated. So between properties in the, in the frequency domain and specific structures in the spatial domain, but finding those links for specific nodes, it's not straightforward, okay? There are some general high level connections with respect to communities, but not on a single node. That's why we would like to really perform convolution on a spatial domain. So that's where uh, people starting to look into a graph view on convolution and say, okay, let's go back to the image, okay? Then we do exactly the same that we do with images with graphs. So an image, a convolution on an image is basically considering pixels, okay, as a grid. So I'm centering on this pixel, and then uh, I have my 
convolutional filter where the first element of the peak uh, of these uh, nine, uh, three by three um, parameter matrix is multiplied by the first element of the, by the pixel on the top left corner. The second element of this weight matrix is multiplied by the pixel on the, on the right hand side of the top left corner and so on. And that's how it works with the image with image convolution. Now, this is a grid. Would it work for for a non regular graph? A grid is a regular graph. Well, the problem is that there are a bunch of key assumptions in this particular graph that makes it difficult to generalize. Okay, so the first assumption is that about regularity, okay, Regular, regularity of the neighborhood. The fact that if I center on a pixel, I will always find, uh, for instance, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight neighbors of that pixel, and only eight neighbors of a pixel. That's not true in a general graph. You can have fewer, you can have more. If you're an up node in a social network, you will have millions of neighbors. If you are a uh, a non-influencer guy, you will have hundreds of friends. So the number of neighbors changes. The other th assumption that you have there is the assumption that if you move, uh, you can move up in, in directions and those directions are well-defined. So you can scan the grid left to right and, uh, and top to bottom in all the different images and you always find this coherent ordering, left to right, top to bottom that's not available in a graph because in a graph you don't have in general a well-defined ordering between nodes. And even worse, you don't have a well-defined ordering between graphs. That's the issue. Whereas between, between uh, images, you have well-defined pixel order, okay? So all in all, you don't have a regular neighbor, you don't have a total node ordering, okay? Between graphs and within the same graph. So uh, that's why uh, this is just picturing out what I've said before. So if you focus on this node uh, here, on yellow node again, and you say, give me the four neighborhoods, neighborhood of that node, of that node. Okay, that's this guy here, this guy here, this guy here, and this guy here, for instance. Okay, it's a four neighborhood node, uh, neighborhood of that node. Yes, but that's just a, one possible neighborhood. Okay, there might be multiple, depending on how you define the neighborhood, depending on how you visit the graph. If you visit bread first, it will be this. If you go for some random walk, this can be a neighborhood of, an, of a node. So really, there might be multiple neighborhoods of a node, even four neighborhoods of a node, which has multiple na direct neighbors can be different, okay? So it's not easy to define a uh, neighborhood of a node in a coherent way, okay? And even, even worse, even if you can define a four neighborhood of a node, then finding out an ordering between the neighbors that I need to map neighbors to the specific, uh, to the specific weights, that's difficult. Why? Because as usual, I can assume that if this is my convolutional filter, okay, I can fit the central node of the convolution to W3, and that's the yellow, fine. But then, which of these guys here, which of the blue nodes is W1? I don't know. Okay, I can decide that this is for, uh, W1. But then when I'm in this neighborhood here, which one is W1? Why is this W1 and not this is W1? Okay, finding a coherent node ordering that allows you to apply the different weights to the different neighbors is not easy, it's not uh, straightforward. To apply. Okay. Uh, so all in all, if I really want to do spatial, spatial, um, let's say, uh, spatial convolutions, what I need to find is a way to have coherent node ordering between different graphs and within the graph between the different neighborhoods. Okay. This is not impossible. Okay. Actually, Nieper, Tame, the Kutsov at ICML 2016 proposed a a way to do that, and it's based on what you would imagine because it's something that is uh, already known in the machine learning literature. It's the Westphaler Lemon uh, um, uh, test of uh, graph isomorphism, 
it's known uh, it's something that comes from the graph theory or graph uh, graph algorithmics uh, but it's been used for instance for ages in the kernel uh, in the kernel community to write down kernels for graphs and uh, what basically does is a recall iterative recoloring of nodes and as a byproduct of that you can basically find out coherent orderings between uh, between nodes in different graphs okay you can leverage it uh, the fact is that can you do like state several properties that ever has to have to be considered as one? Yes, but it's a strong assumption. I mean, it, it's um, you're you're assuming that there exist properties that are neighbor neighbor as uh, that allow it to be, uh, let's say, univocally defined as a neighbor and neighborhood number x. This is not true in general. We are seeking for the maximum expressivity. That's the problem. And you want to be as flexible as possible without reducing too much, at least the, at the beginning, the, uh, uh, the uh, scope of application of your model. That's why you want to be flexible. And okay? you want to be as general as possible. That's the, the polar star in this thing. But yeah, of course, that, that's one way, but it's an approximation most of the times, if you'd like to do that. Now, with the with the uh, approach by Patches Sun, what they basically do is they use what's Feller Lemma to find an ordering between nodes in order to apply the convolution in order. And then for the different neighborhoods in a, in a graph, in, um, for the different nodes in a graph, find a neighborhood by breadth first search and then order the nodes within the neighborhood in a coherent way between the different nodes, again using West Feller Lemma. Okay? The problem is that solving this thing of finding a way of ordering all the neighborhoods of a nodes in a graph is known to be NP complete because it's bound to the, uh, to the um, so-called uh, uh, graph normalization problem, which is NP complete, okay? So what you're doing here is a pro finding an approximated solution to this problem, which is known to be NP complete, or what otherwise you would be solving in, a, in polynomial time synthesis. Okay. So with Spiller Lehman, if you push this approach to the limit, in the worst case, it's going to be exponential. Okay. We use it and they truncate it at some point in order to avoid issues. But they basically found a way to apply uh, this, this, uh, this, this, let's say, this approach to graphs. Because you are able to order things in such a way, in some in some ways, in an approximated way, but you are able to do that. And well, honestly, they managed to publish it. It's a it's a nice intuition. It's a good piece of work. Uh, from the perspective of its actual performance, it's not the best performing model. Why? Because you're doing a lot of approximations here and a lot of assumptions about the fact that you can find in a non-exponential time equivalent ordering, which is in practice not working extremely well. Okay, this is not the model you would use. And in general, it's computationally cumbersome because any time you have to apply a convolution, you need to reorder things in the graph. Okay, so it's as not the best solution, but it's worth to know. The reason I'm uh, highlighting this thing now is that. The, there is a source of problem in all this, and it's the fact they are unwilling to apply a convolutional filter made like this to something that is not regular. Okay, and I need to do you use waste filler lemon to be able to find a way to map nodes to specific weights. Okay, because the weights are different. So the solution is also in the problem. The solution is in releasing the assumption that I need to use different weights. For the different neighbors. What instead of having W1, W2, W4, and W5, I only have W. So weight share. All the neighbors will share the weights. I don't have at that time, if I do that, I no longer need to be able to reorder and to find a coherent ordering between neighbors. And that's what the contextual approach does. Okay. We relax the assumption that we need to find an order. We use the same weight for all the neighbors. So Pakistan, it's nice, nice attempt. You can even reuse CNN machinery because we have actually 
you can even use striding on this thing because you have a really one-to-one -one sort of correspondence with that with the uh, convolutions on, uh, on on images but yeah you pay that okay you pay that incredibly from the computational perspective and in the end due to the approximations needed on the performance perspective okay that's why then uh, we would like to go into other approaches and i already know that most likely i'm not going to be able to to show you the generative part because i'm taking it slowly but it's fine it's, it's a tutorial, so if I manage to introduce you to the basic and the fundamentals, I'm, I'm happy anyway. And if this is the base that allows you to follow me uh, nicely, uh, I'm very happy about that. So, uh, the contractive approach is the one building on the Scarcelli and Gori approach in a modern way. Well, the modern approach is that of saying, you know what? This contractivity thing is very smart. It's nice, but it has uh, it's this issue that I need to impose this constraint on this uh, on these uh, recurrent weights that are uh, that I, since they are learned, they are changed all the time. And imposing this constraint can be cumbersome. Uh, can you find a smart way of staying contractive in my dynamical system? So I mean, fix at points if I iterate through all the nodes, but at the same time be efficient. Yes, because there is a family of models which are recurrent models. And remember, we are working basically on a recurrent world with the contractive approach. That is very efficient and that's the property of contractivity. And it's reservoir computing model, like echo state networks. Okay, echo state networks are particular model from this family of reservoir computing in which you do have, uh, they were born in the field of recurrent neural networks. So in, in the field of sequential data processing, what you do have is an input layer okay, here. So here you attach typically the current, uh, the current measurement for the sequence, okay? Sequence at time t, element at time t in the sequence. Here you have a, a recurrent neural network, a recurrent layer, okay? So it's a layer of recurrent neurons. It's a peculiar layer of recurrent neurons because it's uh, typically a lot of recurrent neurons with very few uh, connections. So it's a sparsely connected uh, recurrent layer. And there is another uh, peculiarity here is that the weights from the input layer to the recurrent layer and the internal recurrent layer are, uh, uh, and internal recurrent weights are initialized randomly and never train, okay? The only train part is the readout part. So this is the output, the one, the thing that produces the actual prediction. The weights from the reservoir, from the recurrent neuron to the output layer are trained, okay? And these things works for a certain number of reasons, including theoretical uh, properties that tells you that if these recurrent weights are randomly initialized with some nice properties, okay? Nice properties for this dynamical system, this whole thing works in sequential data processing. The nice thing is that the theoretic, the, the, the property that you need for this, uh, for this dynamical system to work here is contractivity. So you basically randomly initialized this, this layer here, okay, the reservoir layer to be contractive and you never train it. So that's exactly what you need for working with graphs because it's a recurrent network with contractive weights initialized and never touched. So it's going to be effective because you're reducing training only to, the, uh, to this, uh, efficient, sorry, because you're reducing training only to this. So you can basically find out a way of extending the original model, which was meant to be computing, for instance, uh, the, the current activation of the hidden. So this is the recurrent neuron activation Okay, H. In a recurrent neural network, you will compute it as the hyperbolic tangent of the transformation of the current input, okay, plus uh, the, uh, the hidden state multiplied by the, uh, from the previous time step multiplied by recurrent weights, okay? This is how it would work in recurrent case. In the graph case, I'm, which is what you see here, I'm just extending it 
to consider what? Okay, the encoding or the embedding of a state V in terms of what? The hyperbolic tangent that is combining together the label from node V. So this is node V, this is the label of node V, the actual features of node V, the atom that node V represents, okay? And this has a set of parameters V, which are initialized and never trained, plus what? This will be the recurrent part, okay? In this particular case, in the sequential case, you only have one predecessor. In the case of graphs, the predecessors, the equivalent of the predecessors are all the neighbors of node V in the graph, okay? So this is going to be H of V prime, where V prime are the neighbors of node V, so in this particular node V here, the neighbors are VK, V1, and V2. H of V prime is the current encoding of V1, V2, and VK, okay? And this is going to be iterated. Why? Because I need to bring this system to convergence because, I, because in order to compute the encoding of V, I need the encoding of V1. In order to compute the encoding of V1, I need to encode V, okay? So I'm going to be repeating this mutual encoding with the embedding of V and the embedding of uh, V1, V2, and VK keep changing until they start stabilizing. Why? Because they are reaching convergence to their fixed point because the dynamical system that is uh, created by this matrix W okay, here is contracting, basically. Okay? So it has fixed points. And that's basically it. Okay, you do have a way to take your graph and each of the nodes of the graph, bring each of the nodes of the graph to an, an encoding H of V. So basically that's what happens. You start with, a, with an original graph. This is your original graph, okay? In the left-hand side, with uh, X of V1 being the original label of uh, vector one, uh, of, of, of node one, X of V2, the original label of node two, and so on. When you pass it, this is the input, okay? When you pass it to the reservoir, what you obtain is again a graph in which each of the nodes of the graph at convergence. So when things, when the contractive dynamics has led to the all the things to the second to the fixed point, yes, that's uh, for that's the idea is that you get uh, different fixed points for the different uh, vectors, clearly. Yes, ideally, you get uh, different, uh, you expect to get to fixed point for the single nodes, okay? So the different nodes uh, can possibly get different uh, convergences, convergent points. But you have, since you have a contracted dynamics, you, you are ensured basically to reach a fixed point for all these, uh, for, for all this. That's the idea in the end. So, and that's a good point because what you're getting is a different H1, so a different fixed point for each V1, for each V. So what I'm obtaining is essentially a relabeling. After the original graph has passed through the reservoir, I'm obtaining a relabeled graph, okay? Where what was previously X of V1 now is H of 1 V1. So it's the embedding for node one, obtain it at convergence of the, of the dynamics. Uh, that's a good point. Actually, the properties of the reservoir uh, uh, tells you that the initial state becomes non-important in the end if you iterate enough. And that's among the nice properties of this dynamical system. So uh, yes, the, uh, the initial state is only important for a limited amount of time and then you forget about it because you have a limited memory. And as soon as the memory of the initial state fades out, you, uh, you become independent on the initial state. Uh, so you relabel everything. And then what? And then either you use, well, you aggregate the labels, the, these, no, embedding for all the nodes into a unique vector because these vectors are all the same. Or what you can do is you place a second reservoir. So you have a second reservoir, that's why deep reservoir for graphs. 
you have a secondary reservoir that does exactly what the first reservoir was doing with a different set of parameters on the graph relabeled by the, free, the, by the previous reservoir. And you can generalize this to L reservoirs one after the other. Clearly, what you get is that in order to, to propagate things to all the L reservoirs, you need to get the single reservoir to convergence and then proceed, okay? Once that you get at the end at the very last reservoir, what you do is you take all the single nodes that you are, uh, all the embeddings of the vectors that you have obtained in the last reservoir, you sum them, combining them with a weight vector, which is now the vector of weights that you can train, because this is a linear, as you can see here, you're obtaining the output for the full graph by summing up the encoding for all the vectors in the graph multiplied by a weight vector. This weight vector is initialized. This is a linear system. So if you're training in supervised task, this is a linear system, closed form solution, okay? Or rich regression, whatever, a solution to a least mean square problem. Okay, so it's even in closed form, or you can train it recursively by back propagation, whatever, but you even have a closed form solution, okay? So this is extremely fast. And the nice thing about this whole uh, model is that really you can obtain a model that can get, uh, that can train on graphs in seconds rather than in hours, okay? There is one price to pay is the fact that, again, you need to pay the convergence time to fixed point price, price also at inference time, because you're gonna be needing to lead all the reservoirs to convergence in order to be able to compute the output of this train, okay? So, you're uh, very efficient on the training side, on a, on a training time. And if you check out the paper, you're gonna be seeing how efficient that is. You are going to be possibly paying a slightly increased uh, price at inference time, depending on, uh, on which model you compare with. Now, let me go to the final, to the final uh, let's say, set of fundamental models and then we, let's say, wrap up things, okay? I don't, I don't want to over, overload the thing by running through two concepts if, I, if we don't have time. So let's stay on the on fundamental models and see what we get. The last family that I want to introduce you to is that of contextual graph processing. So basically, it's the family of models that follow it up uh, the, the approach by the neural network for graphs by Alice and Kim, okay? And well, there was an original family, an original paper that was actually implementing a contextual approach in a very specialized, um, let's say, setting that is that of learning with molecules. And it's uh, no random that it happened there because what the guys did, uh, David Duveno and uh, colleagues just a second sorry okay sorry about that what david juveno did uh, is takes a technique that was available in the chemical uh, in the chemical uh, literature that is that of chemical fingerprints this technique is a deterministic technique that takes a molecule in input, and a molecule is a graph of atoms in which nodes are atoms and links are atomic bonds, and transform uh, molecules into a vector of uh, counts, okay? So this, what you obtain here at the top, is a vector of counts of what? Well, of co-occurrences of atoms, okay? Co-occurrences of atoms linked by bonds linked by bonds somehow, okay? And why you do that? Well, because chemistry people would like to find a fixed length encoding for molecules that can be different in change in, in, in size, in topology and so on, okay? And in order to be able to capture, uh, let's say co-occurrences of atoms at different levels of, uh, of uh, resolution, what they did is basically compute this, uh, this co-occurrence vector at different, with different layers, basically. So there is a relabeling uh, approach here. So basically, at this level one here, you're computing concurrence of, uh, uh, let's say, you're relabeling this node here as the co-occurrence of 
uh, this atom with other surrounding atoms. Okay. At this level here, you are relabeling this node here as the co-occurrence of this symbol with this other symbol. So basically, you're incrementally enlarging the scope of the co-occurrence you can capture. And then in the end, you sum up things into this vector of, um, of counts. What David Juvenot and McLaurin did is basically take the, uh, the molecule fingerprint uh, computation and make it neural, okay? Instead of being deterministic counts on, on co-occurrence, these are layers, neural layers that do this stuff here, which is basically summing up the representation of the nodes from the previous layer, smoothing them by a smoothing function like a sigmoid. And then instead of counting, like actual counting, doing something differentiable, like soft maxing and summing, okay, to the field of things. So you're soft maxing things and then sum into this fingerprint here in such a way that there is no, everything is differentiable, is soft, and you can back propagate through things. You have weights here at some point and uh, you can update those, okay? So this is a smart initial application, this contextual layer-wise, thing because all the layers in this approach here are multi-layer, sort of multi-layer, feed forward anyway, okay? So there is no recurrency just like there is in the previous approach. Then, well, the thing has been made uh, more general, okay, by the concept of node embedding. Node embedding were uh, born thanks, uh, thanks to the work of the Ural Escovich group at Stanford, where they clearly took the idea from, uh, from, node embed from word embeddings and said, you know what? We're finding embeddings of words based on the surrounding context. We can do the same in graphs. We can say that uh, the embedding of a node is depending on the surrounding context of a node. What is the surrounding context of a node? Well, it can be the, for instance, the random walks that I take to reach the node, okay? The, the, the nodes that I, that, I encounter, that I encounter in a random node, uh, walk leading to, to uh, a specific mode. Context can be defined in many other ways, okay? And they generalized it across the years from um, purely random work to other forms of neighborhood to different forms of aggregation function. But the concept is that if you're given a graph, you would like to find a, an encoding function phi that operates on the nodes of the graph and projects the node of the graph into an embedding space, which is an embedding space, okay? And in this embedding space, some nice properties are preserved. For instance, this encoder phi ensures that nodes that are directly connected by a link get embedded nearby in the embedding space and farther, for instance, from node K, which is not directly connected. So this is only one of the possible properties that you would like to have on the encoder phi. So this is a general scheme rather than an actual model. Okay. Now, how does the encoder phi need to work? It needs to encode a, back, a node k, taking into consideration its context. The context can be the full graph, but that becomes infeasible computationally. So what typically we do is we have an encoder phi, which for node k takes into consideration a subset of the nodes in the graph, which is the what we call the neighborhood of node K. Different models stem from the fact that you just define a neighborhood in a different way. Different nodes stem from the fact that you define the different, uh, the, the, the function phi in different ways, okay? And so what are these, let's say, the uh, fundamental underlying operation on all these different models that can stem from this uh, unique intuition, this intuition of the embedding, there are two fundamental principles, which is neighborhood aggregation and layering, okay? This is, again, is a repetita and just a formalization of what I started to introduce with the uh, neural network for graphs. So what you're seeing here is, again, a graph, okay? A graph processed at different layers, layer one, layer zero, layer one, layer two. So you can think of that you're processing the graph in a multiple layers, okay? Then we're gonna be seeing what these multiple layers mean. So whenever I'm in layer zero, I'm taking my node U and embedding it. So finding an embedding in this metric space by considering only information about itself, okay? Same for node V, same for this node here and so on. 
Now let's get to layer one, which is when things get more interesting. With layer one, let's focus on node B. How do I find the embedding on node B at layer one? In using the approach from Michele. So I'm not looking at the embedding of my neighbors at the same layer because that will introduce mutual dependencies in encoding. Rather, I'm looking at the embedding of my neighbors, but at the previous layer, because in the layer, embeddings are already computed. Okay. So what I do, I have this green box, which is my embedding function phi, okay, which takes an input. The, the neighbors of V, okay? The neighbors of V, direct neighbors of V are this node, this node, and this node, but at the previous layer. So this node, this node, and this node. So it's taking the embeddings from the previous layer, aggregating them somehow, and obtaining a new embedding for node V, okay? And that's using the concept of neighborhood aggregation. Neighborhood aggregation is exactly this. I'm finding embedding on node V by aggregating the embedding of my neighbors, not from the current layer, but from the previous layer, and that's the layering approach. Note there is one extremely nice property about the layering. Focus on node U. The node U at layer two, say, sorry, focus on node U here, okay? Node U here at layer one is embedded based on its neighbor. Its neighbor is node V. Okay, it's embedded on uh, the, using the information on V, but from the previous layer. Okay, so when I compute embedding on node U, basically I'm taking the information from here and using it to create U. Okay, so at layer L1, the embedding of node U contains information on node U itself, its label, for instance, plus information on the label of node V, because it comes from layer L0. Let's look at layer two. At layer two, I compute the embedding of node U using the embedding of node V at layer one. But the embedding of node V at layer one also contains information of the, on the labels of this node and this node, which are not directly connected to U. But the fact of being layering ensures that at layer two, I already have information on node V on this node and on this node thanks to node V at the previous layer. So this tells you that if you have a, even a large scale graph, provided that you can layer enough, you're going to be able to route information from any node in the graph to any other node in the graph, even if they are very far away in the graph, OK? And actually, in the Alessio Smigeli paper, there is already an estimate on the, uh, let's say, theoretical number of layers you need to cover, uh, to have to cover the full graph, and that is clearly connected with the, with the, um, with the graph radius, basically, okay? So this is the intuition. Let me just wrap it up with uh, a couple of actual models, and then I, I leave you stage for, for some 10 minutes for, for questions. I haven't yet told you what's inside of the green box. Okay, what's inside of the green box? The green box does this job, okay? Gets an input, a set of uh, variable neighbors of a node V, okay, from the previous layer. So this is the embedding from the nodes I, J, and K, which are the neighbors of V, from layer L minus one. And this green thing outputs the encoding of V for layer L. This is clearly a neural network, okay? That's just a learning model, a neural network, let's say, okay? That computes this thing here. So it's computing the embedding of node V at layer L as a nonlinear transformation, whatever sort, even a relu, of what? Well, it, it is going to be having inside here some weights, trainable weights at layer L, multiplied by what? An aggregation of the inputs. Why do I need an aggregation of the input? Because the number of input can change for, for different vertices. So since I want to be reapplying exactly the same green box to multiple vertices, I need this green box to be able to compress a, set, a variable number of inputs into a fixed length thing. So what this aggregation function can be, it's 
any function that sums up things, okay? So for instance, any pooling function. So the sum of the input, the mean of the input encodings, the maximum over the inputs. Think about a pooling function, fit it there, okay? And this nonlinearity will also operate on somehow on the encoding of the node itself, okay? This is usually always there. Why? Because you don't want to forget who you are when you're encoding yourself, okay? And you have a different set of weights for that. Whereas all the neighbors share okay, the same set of nodes. This allows you to, cater, to not have to care about how many neighbors you have. Now, actually, this is the very general uh, picture that you get. The graph convolutional layer, so this is the generic formulation for several many uh, neural network graphs model you find in literature. They all operate according to this general scheme in which you have the new state for a vector for a for a uh, for a um, for a vertex v as an, some sort of transformation a layer l plus one that is based on the previous value for that specific vector plus some aggregation of the neighborhood, okay? Psi is a permutation invariant function whose job is to take a variable number of neighbors of a node and compress it into a fixed length representation. This is a potentially a nonlinear transformation or a linear transformation of an identity or an identity function applied to the single embeddings of all the neighbors of my vertex V from the previous layer. And often this thing is the identity function, okay? And that's it, okay? So that's the general scheme. You can obtain all the models that you would like by changing the way you assemble a neighborhood, changing what kind of transformation you operate on the single uh, embeddings, change the way you pick up your permutation invariant function, change the way you pick up this thing here, okay? If you wanna know how you cast this into a certain number of models in literature, there is a nice neural network paper. It's nice because it's actually authored by myself and my group actually. So it's, it's actually self-promotion. It's a tutorial introduction to deep learning uh, for graphs that's uh, basically casting this formula among the other things on the available models in literature. Now, very good question. With the dimension of bending the number of nodes, how can the last layer weight deal with graph of different size and shape? by generalizing exactly this concept of permutation invariant function to the last layer as well. So what the last layer would be doing if I'm taking a prediction on the full graph might be as simple as taking the embedding of all the nodes in the last, in the last layer and summing them up. And then I will obtain a, an embedding okay, for the graph, which is the size of the neurons in the last, uh, in the last layer and it's the sum of all the nodes, uh, of, of all the node embedding uh, uh, obtained in the last thing. So I can transform different sides of the graph into a, a vector of uh, fixed dimensionality, okay? And again, the summing everything can be one solution, okay? You can have other uh, functions, okay? They need to be permutation invariant, why they need to be permutation invariant functions? Because otherwise you need to assume that you have a knowledge about a uh, coherent ordering between the nodes within the graph and between the graphs. So you don't want to assume that, you want to be general enough, so you'd like to use permutation invariant functions. Sounds are fantastic, okay, from this perspective. Actually, there is one paper that is called the Graph Isomorphism Network Paper, which is theoretically proving that sum is better. Okay. Actually, the paper is quite articulated in the theoretical uh, framework that it builds, but it basically studies uh, the expressivity of neural network for graphs with respect to what? Uh, the voice failure lemon test of graph isomorphism. So it tells you if a specific graph neural network with a specific choice of, the, uh, of these functions here is able to differentiate uh, graphs as well as a voice failure lemon uh, test of level one, 
or level two or level whatever. Okay, actually they focus on level one. And what they say is basically that if you want your graph neural network or deep neural network for graph, whatever it is, to be able to, de to be as powerful as a Westphalian Lehman uh, test of graph isomorphism, you need to pick up an aggregation function which is injective on multisets. Why? Because given a multiset of, of neighbors, you would like that that multiset of neighbors is uh, mapped into a very specific embedding uh, in the next layer. Okay, so if you change the, the your neighbors, you would like to be projected into a different point into the next new layer. Why? Because this allows you to to understand where uh, if a node has a different neighborhood. If you are allowed to understand if you have a different neighborhood, you're allowed to different to understand if a graph is different from another. Okay, that's basically in, in, in principle the idea. Okay. And well, basically what they uh, what they show really is, is nice is the fact that uh, uh, the sum is a good uh, uh, is a good uh, um, let's say injective function of a multiset, and they also show that is actually any any function of a multiset can be decomposed uh, uh, in terms of um, basically linear combinations. Okay, so that uh, that tells you that you have all the properties that you would like. In, the, in that operator, and that operator is also enough expressive to be used for, for representing all, uh, let's say, multi-layer perception operations that you might want to do on a, on a, on a graph. And this has created all stream of research of people showing how you can enhance the, uh, the expressivity of neural networks by, uh, let's say, enlarging the neighborhood uh, and uh, making it more complex, actually. So in order to have Westphalian Lehman test uh, of level two, three, and so on, level K, depending on, uh, on the complexity, basically what you do is you use an hypergraph approach, more or less. So you just start including larger and larger neighborhoods uh, into, and taking into consideration more complicated definition of neighborhoods, basically. Let me conclude just by saying that in, in order to make the things work nicely, we have assumed that when I'm computing the embedding of a, of a node, I'm taking into consideration, I'm, I'm assuming that all the neighbors share the same weight. But this is not truly what I would like to obtain. I would like to be able to weight my neighbors differently. So how do I do that? I cannot assign a single weight to the neighbors because that would require knowing complete ordering. But what I can do is use attention instead. Attention to, to weight the contribution of the neighbors to that specific single weight that I'm sharing between the neighbors differently. So you can create a model in which the embedding of node i is a nonlinear transformation of something that is basically the summation over my neighbors of the neighbor multiplied by the unique weight shared by all neighbors but each different neighbor is weighted by an attention value, alpha, which measures how uh, relevant is neighbor J to the encoding of node I. And that allows me to perform also weighted combinations where each neighbor gets a different weight. This case has been generalized. So the original paper, the graph attention uh, network paper, uh, paper by Velikovic and uh, Pietro Leo and, and the group is from ITL 2018. But this has created a whole stream of other approaches using different type of graph attention mechanism on graph, of attention mechanism on graphs. Okay, so I invite you to check over also the, the following literature. And what else? I think, well, how do you train this? But this you train it basically by having all your different layer, all with different uh, weights. And in the end, as I said, you, for instance, uh, sum up the embeddings for all the nodes in, uh, in, uh, in the different, uh, in the last layer into a unique embedding for the full graph. You use it to output a prediction for the graph. And then if you want to train, you back propagate, okay? Throughout all the layers. Now, this was the last slide for the first part, which is of course not leading to the second part because we have, Included the the time, 
but it was also motivating uh, the thing that I'm not showing you today, but I'm inviting you to reason on in the end of this lecture, of this, uh, of this tutorial, is the fact that this, F, this need of being back propagating from a single prediction all the way throughout uh, very many layers, for instance, and each layer is finding an incremental representation of the graph as an issue. And that's classical issue that we have with deep learning models, okay? It's an issue with the fact that if this number of layers grows, uh, then it becomes difficult to obtain something sensible out of the learning, okay? And even if you put residual connections or jumping connections as are called, uh, jumping knowledge connections as they're called in this literature, this does not help much because what you find is a, what is called a, an effect of over smoothing. So layer, as soon as layer becomes a little bit uh, deep, uh, increment, uh, layers do not become very much specific after a while. They tend to assign the same node embedding to all the nodes. Okay? So that motivates the need for different approaches, approaches that, for instance, learn locally. So each layer is trained individually. Approach that do not need a supervised error in the end, but maybe use uh, local and supervised uh, criteria to find node embeddings which are not task specific, but rather are structure specific. So these node embeddings describe the properties of the graph itself. And then as soon as you find this embedding, then you can always mount on the top of it a task specific predictor maybe multiple task specific predictor. Uh, universality representation, yes, yes, that's a nice question. There is for certain a beautiful paper by uh, Scarcelli, I think that is doing it for, um, for, the, uh, for the case of the graph, the contractive case, okay. And that might be, there might be something also for the uh, contextual case in there, but I don't remember. Surely there was something about the contractive, the contractive case. Uh, but I strongly suspect I, I don't have a reference in my mind for the for the contextual case, but I strongly suspect that something is out there. Sorry, I don't have the reference for that. For for um, for the other case, I uh, that there should be. So, okay, the questions, are the layers specifically for state like relation and, and point for dynamic system stable states might never be attained and discrete single time step changes are typically. Uh -huh. Future states, there will seem to be a huge challenge, especially for large networks. Uh -huh. The specific techniques for spatial temporal graph analysis. <laughs> okay. Uh, there special, special techniques for spatial temporal graph analysis. There are, there are attempts to do so because they, I think this is one of the interesting line of research. It's one of the things I would have mentioned as a, as a nice uh, research topic. Uh, I think the, the, the temporal dimension in the graph analysis because what have you done here is basically focusing a lot on the spatial representation, so the relationship between the nodes. But as soon as we add the temporal dimension to the graph, the things starts getting particularly articulated. I mean, there are approaches, but they are, you know, the way I've seen it classically, there are approaches that tend to simplify the thing. So they either go to uh, assume that we have a single graph, so network-like data with a, a temporal dimension so basically everything becomes a tensor and the, let's say the operation then become basically factorization on this tensor, which is not, uh, which is a tensor because you have the three, because you have the matrix, uh, the agency matrix projected on a third dimension, which is time, okay? And then things basically are operated on uh, with the tensor decomposition techniques. The other approach, that people are using, especially when you cannot assume that there is a single weight, a single adjacency matrix uh, that then becomes a tensor, so you have multiple graphs, uh, is a simplifying uh, is a simplistic approach, but it's that of saying, you know what, I first 
pass everything through a graph convolutional neural network, obtain a single embedding for, for, the, for the full graph, and then feed the, a, um, for instance, a sequence of graph as a sequence of vectorial embeddings of the graph to a recurrent neural network, or a sequence of um, node embeddings for uh, in time to a, a recurrent neural networks. But this is not truly capturing the co-occurrence of, you know, at least in my opinion, of uh, patterns in space and time, because you're separating the part of the network that does the spatial, uh, the extraction of the embedding from the spatial dimension from the part of the network that does the extraction of the embedding from the temporal dimension. Where, what would be interesting to do is to do the, both things at the same time. And that's not at all easy. I think that's that's a nice open open issue. Haha, <laughs> graph modules. Oh, that's that's another question. Good question. Uh, this is intimately connected with uh, one argument that I didn't touch, but is that of pooling operators, reduction operators on graphs, because you really would, would like to obtain uh, a modularization of graphs. Why? Because modules yeah, or communities in graph are helpful uh, for scalability because you are, it allows you, for instance, to distribute your graph, but also helpful in order to fasten the exchange of information. Because you would like, for instance, to have a convolutional uh, oper a layer operating on, uh, on the original graph, maybe followed by a module or by a, a layer that is able to infer if in the original graph there are modules that can be compressed to obtain a reduced graph on which you can then run another set of uh, another set of uh, um, convolutional operations okay and this way your convolutional operator uh, operation uh, uh, layers are operating on increasingly reduced graphs extracting information on the graph at different levels of granularity and that it's nice because it reduces the obvious mountain problem so you always you, you're able to have deeper graphs, deeper networks, because you change all the time the, the structure. It allows you to extract information on different level of resolution. It's, it's un, uh, nice under many, many, um, many perspectives. The key things research-wise, I think, in that, in that particular field, the field about inferring modules or how to reduce graph, how to put together uh, nodes, is how you do that in a theoretically sound way. Because you would like to be doing this graph reduction, this pooling, this understanding of modules in a graph in a, with some uh, property preserving operation. So you would like to have control on whether the reduced graph preserves original distances in the, in the graph, or it preserves uh, spectral properties of the original graph. So the reduced graph should be a nice approximation of the spectral properties of the original graph in such a way that and when you reduce the, the structure, you really, really find something that has a meaning. Otherwise, what you can observe with the several approaches that are in literature is that sometimes going with random edit operation on the graph or random pruning operation on the graph, you can get to similar performances than uh, non-solid uh, uh, pooling operators, so operators that do not impose, uh, they are not enhanced with, uh, with the theoretical properties, okay? So I think that's another very interesting area of research, looking into how you can reduce a graph, how you can identify communities and modules in a graph with uh, good properties, good theoretical properties about what you're getting. And I think I've... <laughs> largely uh, run out of time. So let me just go to the final slides. I'm skipping the whole, uh, the whole part that I had in mind about operation, but it's, it's fine. I'm going to be releasing the slides anyway in their full form, so you're going to be finding things there. Let me conclude with, uh, with a few references. Uh, there is especially a session that we're running at this conference, this European conference on deep learning for graphs, co-organized by Cesare Alipi, who is a friend of the IEEE community, uh, Filippo Maria Bianchi, Benjamin Passen. And these are the references for the, neuro, um, 
the task force on learning for structured data by the IEEE. So I strongly invite you to check over and maybe subscribe, ask things. I'm, I'm there, you have my contacts. And there is a little bit about the advertisement time in the end. This is a beautiful paper from, uh, well, beautiful. It's, a, it's our paper. It's a paper that allegedly attempts a gentle introduction to the field. You're gonna be finding all the references of the work that I've been introducing here. It's published on neural networks and it's a review tutorial paper there. And if you're interested in software, we have our own Python library for deep graph networks, which actually bases on another Python library. There are a couple of them. Uh, they are mentioned in the paper. So if you wanna know more, just check out the neural networks paper. But if you're interested in a library that is especially specifically meant to fasten quick prototyping of uh, deep neural networks and uh, their, uh, let's say, uh, benchmarking, uh, check, check uh, this one out. This, the major contribution is a PhD student of mine, very brilliant guy. And uh, well, that's it. I'm really now out of time, so uh, I shouldn't be eating up the time for other uh, conference venue, uh, for conference events. So let me thank you for attending. And uh, I'm available if you have questions, want to discuss things about this, want to get involved into the task force, anything, collaboration. I'm here, you have my contacts. And this one is going to be, this presentation and other material are going to be on the, on the website of the task force, learning for graphs. Thank you. Thank you very much.